Thank you. Wasn't that a terrific talk in the last hour? Um, uh, <clears throat> I did my PhD work on the origin of life problem. I wrote the big book, Signature in the Cell, and it's just tremendous to listen to Jim explain the details of the chemistry that have to be overcome, or that have to be manipulated, the sequencing problem, all of that. It's, it's just fascinating. And it, as I was listening to him, it reminded me of, of something that uh, I wrote in the prologue to Darwin's Doubt, which I'll be talking about in this hour, uh, which is not about the problem of, the, of, uh, of chemical evolution, the, which is the attempt to explain the origin of the first life from simpler non-living chemicals, but rather the problems faced by biological evolution. And in the prologue to, to my book, I wrote that rarely has there been such a great disparity between the popular perception of a theory and its actual standing in the relevant peer-reviewed scientific literature. Sound familiar? This is kind of the same thing that Jim was just saying about prebiotic um, uh, chemistry and uh, chemical evolution. Today, modern neo-Darwinism seems to enjoy almost universal acclaim among science journalists, bloggers, biology textbook writers, and other popular spokespersons for science as the great unifying theory of all biology. But then I go on to say, but there's big problems with the theory that are being reported in the peer-reviewed literature that are not being reported to the public. And this idea came home to me with great force here in the state of Texas, 2009. Okay, so I'm testifying 2009, Texas State Board of Education. They have a standard that they're considering um, to encourage teachers to teach the strengths and weaknesses of competing scientific theories. Seems like sweet reason to almost everybody. But the Darwin-only science education lobby turns up in force, and they, says you can't, they say, we, you can't apply that standard to Darwinian theory because, and this is Eugenie Scott speaking to the Dallas Morning News at the time, there are no weaknesses in the theory of evolution. And I thought, that, I mean, this is kind of a very common statement that you hear, you know, and, but I thought it was breathtaking. I was there to testify. I had 100 peer-reviewed papers to submit in evidence of significant problems with contemporary theory of evolution known as neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory that we all have been taught and is still being taught in modern high school and college biology texts. The theory emphasizes the role, the creative power of mutation and natural selection. Many leading evolutionary biologists, to say nothing of molecular, cell, developmental, or other types of biologists, are, have, been, have been pointing out problems with that claim for a long time. The mechanism does a good job of explaining small-scale variation. Peppered moths that have their wings turn light and dark and light again, or finch beaks that get a little bigger, a little smaller in, in response to varying uh, environmental conditions, but it does a really, it does a, a poor and inadequate job of explaining the origin of birds or moths or insects or mammals or animals in the first place. And um, so I, I testified at the, at, at the hearing, but I, I found this was really striking. And you get, of course, these, this same kind of overstatement, next slide please, um, in, um, in, in lots of popular presentations of the theory. This is, of course, Richard Dawkins. I love this because He's, he just, he's just such delicious invective against people who disagree. He says, it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is either ignorant, stupid, or insane. But then, you know, he, he's so kind here. He says, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. So um, we had this little thing going on at one of the main uh, news and public affairs magazines right now, and a writer has called uh, intelligent design the, a rube bait idea, rube bait intelligent, and when, when my book first came out, one of the Amazon reviewers called it mendacious intellectual pornography, you know, so you get, you get this wonderful invective. Anyway, this is the public presentation of the theory. It, every reasonable person agrees. Michael Ruse at one point said it's fact, 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 but yet you get into the, you get into the peer-reviewed literature, you start talking to people who are actually wrestling with these issues at a scientific level, and it's not so simple. So, uh, next slide. Um, this this uh, really came home to a number of us at this meeting at the Royal Society in 2016, where leading evolutionary biologists called a meeting to discuss the need for a new theory of evolution. And uh, what the, the, the next slide, the, um, the, 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 the conference kicked off with a, 
a, a presentation from Gerd Müller, a leading Austrian uh, theoretical and evolutionary biologist, with a talk titled, The Explanatory Deficits of the Modern Synthesis. The modern synthesis is another name for neo-Darwinism, which synthesized classical Darwinian theory with something called population to genetics to give evolutionary theory a mathematical basis. And Muller went on to explain, next slide please, um, the, uh, several, he had a list of five, but I, I, for this purpose, list three of the major explanatory deficits, things that neo-Darwinism can't explain. It doesn't explain the origin of phenotypic complexity. The phenotype uh, refers to the visible attributes of the, uh, an organism's body. Um, and um, so organisms are really complex. They have an integrated complexity. Neo-Darwinism doesn't explain that. He went on to say it doesn't explain the origin of anatomical novelty. Good, and again, does a good job of explaining the small-scale variations, but not the major innovations that occur in the history of life as documented by the fossil record, the big changes. Um, and it doesn't explain the origin of non-gradual modes of transition. That's another way of talking about abrupt change in the fossil record where fundamentally new forms of life emerge very uh, abruptly without any connection to um, similar forms in, in, lower, in lower strata. So it happens that, next slide, I wrote a book about this, the last two issues. And the book is Darwin's Doubt, uh, and it's about the, the mystery of the Cambrian explosion. And, uh, and, and the Cambrian explosion relates to the points that Mueller was making because it is a, an event in the history of life that documents the abrupt appearance of major new morphology or new forms of life. And in fact, almost all of the major groups of animals arise abruptly in the Cambrian period. Now, um, next slide, please. So the Cambrian explosion we can define as a, a geologically abrupt or sudden appearance of most of the major animal groups and body plans, where a body plan is a unique configuration of, or arrangement, to use the word that Jim used, a very important thing in biology, we're talking about arranging of parts. So it's a, a body plan is a unique arrangement of body parts and tissues. And um, you see in this, this different, uh, uh, line up here, a number of the different major phyla, where the phyla represents the, 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 that is the largest division of classification among the animals, and they would correspond to specific body plans. And so you might look at, for example, on the far right, you've got the arthropods, they have a hard exoskeleton, and just to the left, then we have the chordates, and those are things like fishes or us, which have either an internal notochord or a vertebrae, and... Um, a skeletal system internal to the body. This is a totally different body logic. And depending on whether you have an exoskeleton and an internal skeleton, the, you're going to arrange, the, the, the organism is going to require very different arrangement of parts to have a functional integrity. And so these body plans are real divisions of, um, in a way, conceptually, but also exemplified in real organisms, very different ways of, of being alive. And these very different ways of being alive are uh, come into existence very abruptly in the Cambrian period. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a depiction. I love this slide. One of our, our slide designers did this for us. Show, it packs a lot of information. On the right-hand side, we have the, the sedimentary record. On the left-hand side, the standard geological time scale in millions of years. And then we have just uh, some of the many organisms that arose in this Cambrian period, which is dated about 520 to 530 million years ago. And so it's a very abrupt, geologically sudden um, emergence of these new forms of life with, in almost all of these cases, no discernible connection to any similar form of life in the lower, late Precambrian strata. And that's the, that's the mystery. Okay, next, next slide. So again, let's that, give you a picture of the geologic time scale and the, how abrupt the explosion is. Next slide. So here's, here's, the, here's the, the rub of the problem, if, especially from an evolutionary or Darwinian point of view. Um, Darwin deep, not only proposed the mechanism of natural selection and random variation, and uh, now we would talk about random mutations, to explain the origin of these new forms of life, but the nature of the mechanism requires it to work very gradually over long periods of time. It's a mechanism that accumulates incremental change little by little by little as those incremental changes allegedly confer some functional 
advantage on the organism in which they occur. And so the, 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 the mechanism must work very gradually. Darwin also argued on un independent grounds that the history of life could be best depicted as a gradually unfolding branching tree where the base of the tree would represent something like that first one-celled organism that the origin of life people are trying to explain and then all the other forms of life are, are morphing and changing and branching off from that until finally we get to you know, this would be the, the tree leading to the first animals. We could, all, we could extend that tree all the way to the present, think of all the forms of life that exist today. But this is, this is the, the picture of the history of life where the vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis, axis is uh, morphological change or distance. So we get lots of, lots of different forms of life arising, and, but they're alleged to have done so very gradually with many transitional intermediates leading on the way to those first animal forms. In fact, what we find in the fossil record is, uh, next slide please, a very strikingly divergent um, picture because uh, the, the major groups of organisms do arise very abruptly and so the next slide shows the tension between the data and the theory. And this is, th this is the, the problem known as the Cambrian explosion. Now, Darwin, next slide, was very aware of this and in The Origin of Species discussed it quite extensively and he said as to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. And so he left this as an unsolved mystery. And in my book I call it Darwin's Doubt. I didn't mean to imply, and I've clarified this, that uh, Darwin didn't doubt that he had it right. He thought his theory was correct, but he, he was aware that he had, there were classes of evidence that his theory couldn't adequately explain, and they did give him pause, and this is evidence of that, of that, uh, of that doubt about the adequacy of the theory, uh, or its ability to explain all the evidence, even if he wasn't, at the end of the day, um, gonna doubt his basic concept of evolution by natural selection. Um, okay, so I call this in the book, next slide, the mystery of the missing fossils, and that mystery, Darwin thought would be resolved by future fossil finds. And you might have noticed that in the conference so far, there's been a little bit of a, a reversal of a, of a narrative that you often hear. That it's the advance of science that makes the God hypothesis unnecessary. It's the advance of, the hypo of science that makes you know, the evidence of design evaporate. Well, no, it's actually been just the opposite. The more we've learned about the fine tuning, the more acute the problem has been, the more we've learned about cosmology, the more confident we are the universe had a beginning. And in biology, the more we learned about fossils, the more di distinct this pattern of discontinuity has become. Darwin hoped that in the ensuing years, after 1859, there would be new fossil finds that would fill in those missing ancestral forms that were represented by the blue dots on my diagram a bit ago. Um, and this was called the artifact hypothesis by later paleontologists. And the idea was that the, um, that the missing ancestral forms that we expect to find aren't there as the, the, because there, the, that's just an artifact of incomplete sampling of the fossil record. We haven't looked hard enough or else it's an artifact of, of uh, incomplete preservation. For some reason or another, the depositional environments weren't capable of preserving the, the ancestral precursors. Now, after 160 some odd years since the publication of The Origin of Species, the pattern of abrupt appearance, discontinuity, and then what paleontologists call stasis, where major groups of organisms persist through the fossil record without significant directional change in their structure, that pattern has become much more pronounced, not less pronounced. And one of the fossil finds that, that, that established or reinforced that pattern for the Cambrian explosion was the great find that Stephen Jay Gould wrote about in the Burgess Shale in Canada. And if some of you are Discovery uh, supporters, we did a big, uh, uh, trip up there two summers ago, and it was fantastic. We hiked to the top of the Burgess and saw all the wonderful fossils. But another find, more recent, in the 1980s right up to the present is the find in southern China, the, uh, the Mao Shishan Shale. And there, uh, it was so dramatic that Time Magazine did a, a cover story on this in 1995. They called it Evolution's Big Bang. One of the paleontologists 
in the, in the article quoted said, what I like to ask my evolutionary biologist friends is this, how much faster does this event have to happen before we stop, stop calling it evolution? Because what they found was that the time, the time frame of the Cambrian explosion shrunk further and the number of different dis disparate morphological forms increased, completely new animal forms that were unknown before, but they also appeared very abruptly in the fossil record. <clears throat> the standard date now for the, the Cambrian explosion is about a 10 million year window, but the, 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 there were 13 to 16 new body plans that emerged within a five, year, five to six million year window within just a few feet of sediment. And this is just extraordinary. Uh, it's, you know, within the error bars of paleontological um, uh, time measuring. And so this is really dramatic. And <clears throat> five, five to six million years may not sound a lot also from a biological point of view, but this is also biologically abrupt. There's a whole branch of the evolutionary biology called population genetics, which is an, by which, uh, if you know certain factors, you can estimate how much evolutionary change could occur in a given amount of time, or um, conversely, if a given enough time, if, if a certain amount of time is enough time for a given amount of evolutionary change to occur, and the factors are popula population size, generation time from one parent to offspring, <clears throat> and mutation rates. And on that basis, five to six million years is also a blink of the eye. Uh, there's uh, a, a mathematical biology um, team at Cornell that looked at some, Michael Behe made an argument based on population genetics in his book, The Edge of Evolution, and he argued that to get two coordinated mutations in the hominid line, it would take about a half a billion years, about 500 million years. And these uh, mathematical biologists at Cornell came back and said, no, 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 that's, that's not right. We've worked the, reworked the math. It would only be 216 million years um, to get two coordinated mutations. The, the alleged chimp human divergence is five to six million years ago. It was a moot point. And it takes a lot more than two coordinated mutations to build a whole new uh, you know, form of, of animal life. And so, uh, you know, a five, a, a five to six million year window, a 10 million year window, give the Cambrian, pe you know, the people 20, 40, whatever, it's not nearly enough time on the Darwinian mechanism to build the amount of new structure that's required, the new, morphologi the new morphology. So the Cambrian explosion is abrupt geologically, it's abrupt biologically. And, uh, and so this, is, this has been a big mystery. And I've called this in my book, the first, the first mystery, the next slide is the, I call it the mystery of the missing fossils. And um, uh, this, this came home in a particularly uh, poignant way in uh, the year 2000. We at Discovery Institute, in conjunction with one of our research fellows who's a marine paleobiologist, Paul Chen, were able to host a lecture from one of the leading Chinese paleontologists, J.Y. Chen, at the University of Washington locally in Seattle. And J.Y. Chen was, is one of the Chinese paleontologists who was finding all these wonderful new forms of life in the Cambrian strata there, beautifully preserved. And word got out that he was going to bring fossils to this, this talk. And we had a really good audience of paleontologists and geologists and, um, and uh, evolutionary biologists. And Chen gave a wonderful talk about what had been found, the different, the stratigraphy there, the, he showed a number of the different fossil finds. But late in his talk, he said, you know, this, this whole discovery turns Darwin's tree of life, and he held his hand up like this, upside down. And, whereas in the tree of life, the major differences in form arise as a result of a gradual transformation, simple to complex over a long period of time. That's the Darwinian picture. But instead, he pointed out that the major differences in form were present right from the beginning, and they were disparate. They were very different from each other, as, as exemplified in these different, different body plants. And so he said it turned the tree of life upside down. And there had even been, in 1995, an article in People's Daily talking about the problems of, of Darwinian theory. And so this, when, he, when, he, when he started to talk about the evolutionary implications of this finding, there was a lot of uncomfortable shuffling of feet in the room. And when we got to the Q&A, one of the local University of Washington professors in earth science said, you know, our, uh, Professor Chen, that was a wonderful talk. We love seeing the fossils, but aren't you a little uneasy about um, talking 
about the, the, uh, this challenge to neo-Darwinism. I think it was more a warning than he shouldn't be, but anyway, he said, aren't you a little uneasy talking about this, the, the way these fossils challenge Darwinian theory coming as you do so, from such an authoritarian country? <laughs> and that suddenly made things very uncomfortable because now not only had he kind of put the professor on warning he shouldn't be questioning Darwinism, but he now insulted China, which I thought was kind of in poor taste. And, uh, but Professor Chen was, uh, you know, didn't miss a beat. He was uh, uh, not thrown off by this at all. And he just said, oh, he said, no. He said, in, in China, we, we, we can question Darwinism, just not the government. <laughs> and <clears throat> he then said, I, I, in the United States, he said, uh, you, 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 you can question the government, but you mustn't question Darwinism, he said. <laughs> and, He'd heard about our politically correct uh, institutions. So anyway, this is the mystery of the missing fossils. The, the absence of ancestral intermediates, the abrupt appearance of disparate forms of life without those precursors that are alleged to have produced, the, produced them on Darwinian grounds. Okay, so that's, and, and in my book, I deal, I, I have a lot about this and deal with various attempts to explain away this mystery, but I think it's pretty clear now that mystery has persisted. In fact, recently I've done an article with the German paleontologist Gunter Beckley, who's one of the leading insect paleontologists in the world, and we've written another article in another volume about 17 similar explosions in the history of life. This is, this is the dominant pattern in the fossil record, abrupt appearance and stasis. It's not just the Cambrian period uh, where we have this. All right, next slide. So, is that going forward, go, uh, the, go the other direction, or next slide? Maybe we, I reviewed it. Okay, that's the mystery of the missing fossils, but there is a more fundamental mystery, and that's what I really wanna talk about in the, in the rest of the time we have together. So, next slide discusses the real mystery, and that is, how do you build an animal? Or rather, how would the evolutionary process build an animal form? And that, that mystery has become more acute. It's not just the absence of the, fo the fossil intermediates. It's really the engineering problem that's involved. I, I didn't bring it this time, I wish I had, but I have a, a, a lovely sample of a trilobite, one of those ar Cambrian arthropods. And in this particular specimen I have, you can see the compound eyes. And this is a very sophisticated visual apparatus. Insects, modern insects have them. Um, and the, the, but these compound eyes apparently existed from the very dawn of, of, of animal life. You're, there's no gradual working up to this. You've got a very sophisticated uh, visual apparatus right in the first animals. It's incredible. Okay, so how, do you, how would you build something like that? How would you build all these different cell types, all the different morphological structures involved in all these different forms of life? How would the evolutionary process do that, especially in the limited time that it uh, apparently had? But even if you had more time, how could that be accomplished? Next slide. Um, this, this, uh, this was, of course, the, the, the problem that Mueller was highlighting. He also had an earlier book with a, uh, another biologist, Stuart Newman from NYU, and on page seven is a really seminal book, MIT Press, 2003, on the origination of organismal form. They argue that neo-Darwinism has, as they put it, no theory of the generative. It does a really good job of preserving small advantageous changes, but it doesn't do a good job of innovation. And in the, they had a list of unsolved problems from neo-Darwinism, one of which was the origin of organismal form. And I thought, my goodness, isn't that what Darwin is supposed to have explained back in 1859? Did anyone not, I mean, the word simply, that's another case, the word hasn't gotten out. There was no recall on that idea. Um, okay, next slide. So the, it turns out that there's three main challenges to, well, actually, there's four that I address in the book, but I'm going to address, try to get through three. We'll see how we do on time. But I want to, I, I want to give you an, I want to explain why there is growing skepticism about leading evolutionary biologists and mathematical biologists about the adequacy of the mutation selection mechanism as an explanation for building new forms of animal life. This is the engineering problem. How, do you, how would the evolutionary process build the, the, those forms? Next slide. So this problem became very much more acute as a result of something we've been talking a fair bit about in this conference. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, and that is the problem of the origin of genetic information. And again, next slide. Um, we, if we look at the, 
abrupt appearance of all these new animal forms, we now know that to build these new forms of life, we need a lot of new information. Every new, every new form of animal life has lots of new anatomical structures, new tissues. New tissues are made of new, we have new organs and tissues in the new body plan. Organs and tissues are made of distinct cell types. So for example, you have an animal with a gut, you have to, you have, to have digestive enzymes, enzymes in the gut. But enzymes are proteins and proteins have to be built in accord with the information stored on another molecule. Let's skip forward until we see Watson and Crick here. Could we get to... So you want to build new proteins, you've got to have the information on the uh, new information in DNA. And so essentially, the Cambrian explosion and other fossil explosions like that documented in the fossil record are not only explosions of new form, of new biological form and structure, they're explosions of new information. And that raises a really big question. Where does that information come from? Next slide. What, you may remember, um, 1953, I discussed this really briefly last night, but Watson Crick elucidate the structure of DNA in 1953. In 1957, <clears throat> Crick, who was a code breaker in World War II, I find this fascinating, he's realizing that the informational uh, attributes of the whole gene expression system, and he posits the idea that DNA is encoding information in a digital form, and that the four characters, the the, a, the bases, the A's, T's, G's, and C's that we represent, that chemists represent, used to represent these nucleotide bases, that they're functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a machine code. And this is, a, this is a really important moment in the history of biology. I mean, this is, this is stunning, really, if you stop and think about it. That I, I used an example in the signature in the cell of someone, you know, going to Antarctica and going and finding a, a cave and being pretty sure there was never any intelligent life ever on Antarctica before we get there in 1909 or whenever it was first really explored, going in the cave and then finding complex hieroglyphic inscriptions written on the wall. You get to some place, you go inside this enclosure, and there's, there, there, there's information in, in a code script. And this is essentially what biologists found in, in, in the 1950s. And, and Crick posited this, this sequence hypothesis, and over the next seven to eight years, by about 1965, um, the, the scientists were pretty confident that he was right, the molecular biologists working on both sides of the Atlantic, and they had elucidated what's now known as the gene expression system, or the system for protein synthesis. We don't have time to show you this right now, but there's a little, nice little um, animation on my website and also on YouTube called Journey Inside the Cell that shows how the digital information in the DNA molecule is used to build protein molecules and protein machines. Enzymes are one type of protein that Dr. Tour was talking about in the last session. So next slide. So this is the problem. How do you get the new information, not just to build proteins, but to build whole new animal forms? So you see those new animal forms, you know that at the very least they're gonna require a lot of new proteins to service the new types of cells that are represented in those forms of life. Now the Darwinian explanation for that is that you have these random changes in the sequence of those nucleotide bases, the, essentially the genetic letters or the, the genetic uh, um, characters in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the digital code stored in the DNA molecule. And that those random changes will confer some advantages, they'll generate new information for building new proteins and you'll be able to build up these new structures that way as a result of these small incremental variations being preserved and passed on. Now, the, pro the, the problem with that starts with the, really an understanding of the kind of information that we have in DNA. There are two types of information at least, but uh, this is the analytical, there's a, a distinction that we need to be really clear on. Um, uh, Claude Shannon, the founder of uh, modern mathematical information theory, uh, had uh, <clears throat> de defined information in terms of, of the exclusion of possibilities or the reduction of uncertainty. And so in his mathematical theory, that top sequence would, be, would have a lot of information or information carrying capacity. He could measure the improb... His theory allowed us to measure the improbability of a sequence of characters in a string like that. Uh, but it didn't allow us to distinguish between functional and non-functional information or meaningful and non-meaningful information. So you can see that in addition to... You've got two very improbable strings of characters, but there's a qualitative 
difference between the two, isn't there? You can, everyone see it? One is performing a communication function. The other, as far as we can tell, is gibberish. But both have an equivalent amount of Shannon information measured mathematically as a measure of the improbability of the sequences. Okay, so when we're talking about information in biology, and Crick was very clear on this right from the beginning, we're not talking about merely Shannon information. We're talking about information that performs a function. And in the, in the biological context, it's the function of, of providing the instructions for building functional proteins. Okay, next slide. So um, the problem with the neo-Darwinian mechanism is that it's relying on an undirected process of change mu called mutation to change the character string um, without any concern for the outcome. The, the processes that produce mutation are random in the sense that they are not occurring with respect to the organism's survival needs. They could be any, any, any type of change. But um, our experience of computer code has told us that this is not a really good way to generate new information. Any software developers or programmers here? Okay. If you get a, um, a, you know, a random change to your, if you got a nice piece of software or for a, a program or operating system, you don't want, I suspect, um, random changes to your zeros and ones, right? Uh, bugs and glitches are the enemy of, of proper function. Uh, they're overwhelmingly more likely to degrade function than to settle on something new that's going to be useful and, and functional. Um, and, and so our experience of computer code has made a lot of scientists really skeptical about the, this mechanism. And, next slide. And, this, this, uh, and there, there's a mathematical reason for that. If you, have a, a, if you make a series of random changes to a functional sequence of text or a functional sequence of computer code, you're overwhelmingly more likely to degrade function than to build something new. Why is that? That's because there's so many more ways to go wrong than there are to go right. So for just a, a simple example, for um, any 12-letter sequence in English, uh, if you had a meaningful sequence of 12 letters in English, there are 10, uh, 100 trillion other possible ways of arranging those same letters that don't convey meaning in English. The functional sequences are extremely rare in comparison to the possible sequences. And this turns out to be true of, virtually, of all communication systems that use, use alphabetic, digital, or typographic characters. Okay, so uh, next slide. So in the 1960s, after it became really clear what was going on with the molecular biological revolution and that molecular biologists had basically discovered information embedded in these large macromolecules, uh, the, a lot of mathematicians who were following this, or mathematically inclined scientists, started to get really skeptical. And there was a famous picnic at MIT in 1965 uh, at the home of Victor Weisskopf, a famous physicist. And at that picnic, there were biologists, evolutionary biologists, uh, computer scientists, mathematicians, and physicists. And the quantitative science scientists and the biologists got into quite a heated argument over at this picnic about whether or not neo-Darwinism could really explain the evolution, the origin of new forms of life. And this, this argument was, was inspired by the new discoveries that were being made. And the, the, basically the mathematically inclined scientists were saying, look, if what you guys are saying, you biologists are saying is true about DNA and proteins and their information bearing properties, we don't see how your origin story holds up. We don't see how the neo-Darwinian mechanism could be responsible because what we know about, uh, about uh, computer code is that you start changing that randomly and you're gonna degrade function. You're not gonna get something new and good and helpful. And so this is, uh, this is they, they decided as a result of this discussion to break this out into a larger discussion and have a conference. And it was a, now a famous conference held in 1966 at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia called Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinism. And there were scientists on both sides of this. One of the, the initiators of the conference, Murray Eden, a very high-powered um, um, computer science professor there. I had, the, I had the privilege of meeting him at 89 in a conference 40 years on commemorating this, still sharp as attack. And, but this is what he said. He said, no currently existent, existing formal language can tolerate random changes in the symbol sequences which express its sentences. Meaning is almost invariably destroyed. 
And, a, and again, the reason for that, which Eden explained beautifully in his talk at this conference, and the proceedings still are, are the, these are beautiful proceedings if you, if you have a chance to get them. Next slide. And the, 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 meaning, the reason for this is, again, lots more ways to go wrong than there are to go right. Now, let me break this down into a really fun example. I alluded to this last night in the, in the interview with Eric. But um, if you, if you want to, a combination that opens a lock is an information-rich sequence. It's only got four characters, but it, it provides information for performing a function. So let's imagine we, we have outside the, the, the auditorium here, we have a nice, uh, a, a nice bicycle that's locked with one of these four-dial locks. If, there's a, if I tell you that there's a thief that's coming up to have a go at the lock to see if he can steal the bicycle, is it, well, is it more likely that the thief is going to succeed or fail to open the lock via a random search for the combination. And I kind of I gave this away last night in the interview, but the standard answer I'll get from an audience when I pose this rhetorically is, oh, he's going to fail. More likely that he fail. And I say, wait, 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 wait a minute. It's a trick question. Because we need to know something else, don't we? We need to know how many opportunities the thief has. How diligent is this thief? And, you know, I, I once did this math. If the thief changed one uh, dial, you know, tried a different combination once every 10 seconds, in a little over 15 hours, the thief could sample about 5,000, a little bit more than 5,000 of the combinations. Well, in this particular lock, you've got four times 10, uh, or 10 to the fourth possibilities, which is 10,000 combinations. So if the thief is going to stay out there for 15 hours and we don't have any police walking the block, it's, it actually becomes more likely than not that the thief will succeed. But what if the thief encounters this lock. Next slide, please. Now he's got a little bit of a different problem on his hand. And this gets back to the, the, that great illustration that, that Jim used about exponential numbers, because now we've got 10 times 10 possibilities, um, not, 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 not 10 times 10 times 10, not 10 to the fourth. Now we've got 10 to the 10 possibilities, which is 10 billion. Now if you do that same lock and you give the thief 100 years and the thief does nothing but change the dial every 10 seconds, no potty breaks, no dates, no, you know, no meals. Um, the thief will only, will, will only be able to sample a very small percentage, about 3% of the total number of combinations in 100 years. Now, and so in that case, we have to ask, is it more likely that the thief will succeed or fail? We ask again, is it more likely that the thief will fail or succeed in opening the lock via a random search? Now it's, more, it's overwhelmingly more likely that the thief will fail rather than succeed. Do you see the probabilistic reasoning involved? There's always a chance, but the question is, is the chance hypothesis more likely to be true or false? If it's overwhelmingly more likely that the thief will fail, then the hypothesis that the thief will succeed is more likely to be false than true. Okay? And in science, we really prefer not to affirm hypotheses that we know are more likely to be false than true. Okay? We go on and look for a better explanation. Okay, so... Now, what's, that, what's all this have to do with the Cambrian explosion and the origin of information? Well, this illustrates the problem that the mutation selection mechanism encounters in trying to generate the information that would be necessary, first of all, just to produce one gene uh, capable of, uh, of generating a whole new form of pro, a whole new protein, but it also illustrates the bigger problem of getting lots and lots of new genes with lots and lots of new proteins to build a whole new, whole new animal. So, next slide. So, um, the, in 1966, when they had this conference at the Westar Institute, um, it was not yet known whether the mutation selection mechanism could really do the job, because there was something else we needed to know. We didn't know, in effect, how rare the combination was. In my lock example, there's only one possible combination for opening the lock. When you link together the amino acids that make up proteins, it turns out there's a lot of different combinations that will fold into functional proteins. But there's a lot more that won't. So we need to know the ratio there in order to get a really solid estimate of how hard this random search problem is. So um, in other words, for every one of those nicely folded structure that will represent a, a protein fold, how many of these amino acid combinations are there that don't, okay? So that was the key question that was not well known in 1966. The biologists at the time said, hey, maybe functional proteins are really common. Maybe, the, in effect, there's lots of combinations on the lock that will open the, 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 will open the dials. But 
the, 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 the mathematical scientists, especially the computer guys, were very skeptical of that because, because the reason bike locks work, the reason information can be conveyed, is that you're eliminating possibilities all the time. And so as you have lots of characters in a, in a, in a, in a code script, there's going to inevitably the exponential possibilities are going to mount and the, co the, the functional sequence seems, they thought, to necessarily require a lot of gibberish that you don't use. So anyway, this was unknown, though, in 1966. Next slide. Now, a colleague of mine, Douglas Axe, decided to investigate this very rigorously for 13, he was 13, 14 years at Cambridge University. He had a Caltech PhD in chemical engineering, but his PhD thesis at Caltech had a, a protein science molecular biology application. So after his PhD, he went to Cambridge, he worked for 14 years on this crucial question. How common or rare are the functional sequences among all the possible amino acid combinations? You could ask the same question of the DNA sequence, because the DNA sequence makes the protein sequence. So are the, the, the sequences that are functional, are they rare or are they common? If they're common, you can imagine the Darwinian mechanism working pretty well, because you get a random change and you skip from one functional form to another pretty easily. But if they're rare or if they're exponentially rare, you can search and search and search and search and search and search and never find them. Or you'll be, you know, like your, the Jim Carrey illustration last night. Okay, so anyway, this was, uh, Doug took this on, next slide, and in 2004, he published a fantastic research paper that was a result of, of several previous research papers uh, in the Journal of Molecular Biology with a very definitive, with his results, which was, was a very definitive quantitative estimate of the rarity of functional genes and proteins in what's called combinatorial sequence space. And the conclusion that he reached was that for every functional fold, of a fairly modest length. He was working with a protein system of about 150 amino acids long. Most proteins are about, on average about 300 amino acids in length. So there's a modest length protein. For every functional protein, there are, um, there are 10 to the 77 other possible ways of, amino, of arranging amino acids that won't produce a functional, a, 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 a functional fold. And so that means that if the mutation selection mechanism is searching, it's going to search, 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 search. Well, wait a minute. There's something else we need, we need to know, isn't there? And that's still, we need to know how many opportunities does that mechanism have to work, all right? And it turns out you can estimate that as well. Next slide. You have to, it, to do that, you need to know how many organisms there have been on planet Earth because mutation events can occur when there's what's called a replication event. When an organism reproduces or copies itself, that's when you could have the DNA, the, 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 the arrangements of characters in the DNA code randomly change to produce perhaps a new peptide sequence or amino, uh, amino acid sequence that could form a new protein. Well, it turns out there's, there's been about 10 to the 40th organisms, 10 to the 40th power, that's a lot of organisms, on planet Earth. Next slide. But 10 to the 40th, that would represent the number of trials to randomly change the, the DNA in hopes of getting a new protein, but that number pales in comparison to 10 to the 77. If you remember your, how to divide exponents, you remember you subtract, right? So this, this is equivalent. This, the, 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 the measure of the difficulty of the search is that for every, even if, even if here's, what, here's what, how we say this. If every replication event in the history of life from the beginning of the origin of life till now had been dedicated to searching for a new functional gene capable of building a new functional protein, it would only get to search one over 10 to the 37th of the possibilities. So we were talking a minute ago about searching for one thing out of 10 to the four or 10 to the 10th. Now the, 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 the portion of the search space that gets to be searched, and this is taking into account the whole history of life, is only one out of 10 to the 37th power or one 10 trillion trillion trillionth of the space gets searched change the metaphor just a little bit from bike locks to needle and haystack. We've got a massive haystack the size of Texas. We've hidden one needle in it, and we're going to say that that massive haystack, so that one needle is, represents one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the size of the haystack. Now you ask yourself, is it more likely that the person searching at random is going to find it or not find it? Well, it becomes overwhelmingly more likely that a random search will fail because so such a small portion of the search space can be searched in the time available. Do you get the reasoning? Okay. 
So we apply that to the protein case. Um, you know, 10 to the 40, there's a lot of organisms, that's a lot of replication events, but the search space is so vastly in excess, is so much vastly bigger than that, that still only a tiny, tiny fraction will get searched. And so it's still, it's overwhelmingly more likely than not that the mutation selection mechanism will fail in generating even one gene capable of producing one new protein in the entire history of life on Earth. That's what we're up against with the mutation selection mechanism as a means of generating new information. It's not an adequate mechanism. And that's increasingly recognized. The, the recognition of this started in the 60s, but the work of Doug Axe and four or five other independent uh, ways of, of, of investigating this question of the rarity of genes and proteins in sequence space have confirmed that the, these, the functional sequences are far too rare to be found by a random search method, even with the role of natural selection preserving the, 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 the random thing if it happens to be functional. It's just so unlikely that you would ever find anything functional. There's nothing for natural selection to preserve. Okay. All right, so that's the information problem. Next slide. How are we doing on time? Okay. Now, a, a, another arguably even deeper problem is the problem that's known as the origin of developmental gene regulatory networks or the origin of genetic circuitry. I've only been talking about the problem of getting one gene capable of building one new protein. But to build whole new animal forms, there is a coordination, a choreography that is just breathtaking at the genetic level. And this has been mapped out, next slide please, by a wonderful uh, scientist who only recently died. His name is Eric Davidson at Caltech. And a number of colleagues have worked with him on this. But it, the, the, what he found is that, is that it's not just to, to build a new organism, cells go through multiple divisions. You start with a fertilized egg, you divide into two, into four, into eight, into 16. And at a certain point, those cells start to differentiate from each other. Some become muscle cells, some become bone cells, some become skin. And each, each of those different types of cells express different genetic information for building different dedicated proteins. And it's beautifully choreographed. But in order for that to happen, there has to be communication and you need what are called gene regulatory networks. And these regulatory networks are genes that control the timing and expression of other genetic information. So the right proteins are turned on at the right time as the cells are going through those, those divisions. And as Davidson and his colleagues map this out, they would invariably come up with, with diagrams like this. What does that look like to, say, any engineers in the auditorium? So it looks like an integrated circuit. And from a standpoint of information flow, not electricity flow, that's exactly what it is. And so the way these things work is you'd have a, a, a gene that is not building proteins, but it's coordinating everything else. So it, it would express a gene product. It might be a protein, actually, or it could be a regulatory RNA. And then that would turn on another part of the genome, which would in turn turn on another, uh, build an, another gene product, which would either turn off or turn on another part of the genome. And so you'd get this complex choreography of the right things being expressed at the right time so that the cells have exactly the right proteins they need as they begin to differentiate themselves from other cells as bone and, and, and muscle, skin, and, and, and other things are being built as the animal uh, uh, is, is being constructed through the process of development. Fascinating. Okay, cool, really cool science but it also had a profound implication for evolutionary theory. Because what Davidson and his colleagues found was that these gene regulatory networks are, are indeed, they have a property that other integrated circuits have. Um, it's a rule in engineering that the more functionally integrated a system, the more difficult it is to perturb any part of the system without defect to the whole. You know, you pull out the spark plugs of the, uh, uh, the car doesn't work, okay? So, Integrated, functionally integrated systems are highly sensitive to perturbation, to change in, their, in any of their subsystems. And, the, and, and this system was no, no different. What they found is these developmental gene regulatory networks in, in their core elements could not, be, could not be altered even a little bit without shutting down animal development. When animal development would shut down, the organism would die and no more evolution could even possibly occur at that point. So this was the rub. You need gene regulatory networks to build new forms of animal life, new animal body plants. You've got an animal body plant here, it's got its own gene regulatory network. 
So you want to evolve one animal body plan into another. That's the Darwinian story. But that means you've got to move, you've got to change one developmental gene regulatory network into another type of gene regulatory network. But that's the very thing we've discovered in the laboratory never happens. And so Davidson, who is no friend of uh, theism, creationism, intelligent design, anything like that, just has called uh, neo-Darwinism a catastrophic error in thinking. That the mechanism simply cannot account for this type of complexity and the need to transform one integrated complexity, one integrated system of gene regulation into another. Okay? This is a fundamental problem. And it, 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 like Jim's talk in the last hour, how have people addressed this in evolutionary theory? They really haven't. I mean, there just are not good proposals for solving this problem out there. Okay, third problem. Next, let's go next slide. Um, and this is in some ways perhaps the, big, the, the most fundamental. And this is actually when I quoted the two guys, uh, uh, Stuart uh, Newman and Gerd Muller, this is one of the things that really has bothered them about neo-Darwinism in their writing. Um, and this is the need for what's called epigenetic information. We've been talking about all the important information in DNA. But there are, it turns out that DNA is necessary, the information in DNA is necessary, but not nearly sufficient to build a whole new animal form. In, the, in just that picture of the cell that Dr. Tour showed with the carbohydrates and all the information that they have, they're involved in intracellular signaling, and that's really critical information to animal development as well. And there are many, many sources of information, both in cells and in organisms as they're developing, that are crucial to animal development. Only some of that's in the DNA. So, uh, next slide. Let's get a kind of a sense of this. So, if I want to build a little, uh, you know, a little fish here, uh, there's going to be lots of new types of cells and organs that are going to be needed. Those are going to require new proteins, and we're going to need new d DNA. But the DNA information is only sufficient for building the proteins. DNA turns out to be necessary, but not sufficient for building higher levels of biological form and structure. So uh, here's an analogy, next slide. This is uh, uh, another information-rich hierarchy. We've got a, um, a, a, a laptop computer. So we can now, with uh, the technology known as CAD CAM, we can, uh, we can use information to build single component of an electrical circuit. So we take a flow of information, we build maybe the capacitors and the resistors and the transistors uh, mechanically using information that's encoded uh, in this computer-assisted manufacturer ma manufacturing process. But that, those parts do not a circuit board make, nor does the circuit board make the personal computer. What's critical to make that circuit board is you've got to get all the parts arranged in the right way. Okay? And that requires higher levels of, ins of assembly instructions. And then, likewise, to get the circuit board into a full co the computer, you've got to have a lot of other parts. You've got to have switches and, and cords and all kinds of wires, and you've got to have the chassis, and you've got to have the keyboard, and all of those parts require assembly instructions as well. So the information for building the low-level parts does not suffice to build the whole high-level system. And the same exact thing is true in biology. DNA codes provides information for building proteins, but that information alone is not sufficient to build the higher level structures. And now what that means for evolutionary theory is really profound because the, mut the mutation selection mechanism is operating at the lowest level of that biological hierarchy. If we can go just go back one slide to look at that again, if we look at the DNA, we, we, the, the whole idea of, of neo-Darwinism is you get changes in the DNA strand in the nucleotide sequence, and that's going to give you a new protein. But that means that in the best of cases, even if you can overcome the long odds that we've just been describing to find one of those new proteins in that vast uh, combinatorial sequence space, you're still not going to get to build new cell types, organs, tissues, or body plants, because you need higher level instructions, other sources of information. In my book, Darwin's Doubt, I talk about some of those other sources that are known. There's uh, cytoskeletal arrays, there's the distribution of membrane targets, there's a sugar code, there's intercellular signaling, and we know more and more about some of those other sources of information that are necessary to build full animal body plans. And yet, there's a lot of research to be done on this. We know there's a lot more out there, other sources of information. This sometimes is called epigenetic information 
information or ontogenetic information. The point is, we know that this additional information is necessary. It's not stored in the DNA, and that means you could mutate the DNA till the cows come home, or indefinitely over billions of years, and you will never get beyond generating a new protein, even if you can solve those probabilistic problems I was just talking about. So this is a really fundamental problem, and it's leading a lot of evolutionary biologists to say we need a new theory. Okay, now next slide. Let's, let's, let's uh, bring this home. Many people have proposed new uh, evolutionary theories. So I don't want to only critique neo-Darwinism because in some way that'd be a critiquing a straw man. James Shapiro, who's the leader in this third way, who's looking for new theories of evolution, his is called, the one he prefers is called natural genetic engineering. He says criticism of neo-Darwinism is so early 90s. Um, <laughs> now that word also hasn't gotten into the textbooks apparently or into the popular culture. But in Darwin's doubt, I'm sensitive to the fact that there are many new theories of evolution that have been proposed, and many of them have some real advantages over standard neo-Darwinism. But what I found in researching these is that none of them actually solve the crucial information problem. Professor Shapiro's model is a good illustration of this. He talks about um, uh, the, the processes whereby it's evident that there is sort of a built-in uh, adaptive capacity that if you put an organism under an environmental stress, it will trigger the expression of genetic information that was not being expressed before in order to allow the organism to respond to that stress. And so this is a kind of evolutionary change. The organism is expressing new information, but the information was already there. It, was, it just wasn't being, it wasn't being expressed. The, the environmental change triggered it, but it didn't explain its origin. And as I've looked at each of these different models of evolutionary theory, and you'll have to go to the book to find out about all of them, um, the, the same problem occurs, that they, tend to, they, they invariably presuppose unexplained sources of information, or they just don't talk about the problem of the origin of, of, of genetic and epigenetic information that is necessary to build new animal form. So my estimation, and this is the case I make in the book, is that evolutionary theory has really reached an impasse with respect to this foundational question of how do you build new form? How do you build new animals? How do you generate, how would the evolutionary process generate new information? There are not adequate explanations of that. Next slide. On the other hand, oh yeah, at this Royal Society meeting that was called by the Third Way people, Susan Mazur being one of them, after, afterwards summed up, she said, it, the meeting was, was characterized by a lack of momentousness. The problem was really well characterized, but there were no real fundamental solutions offered. So where do we go then? Are we stuck? Well, this is where I think the theory of intelligent design comes in. And when you think about the, something like the model of natural genetic engineering, you're talking about a system with pre-programmed adaptive capacity. What's that sound like? Um, where does programming come from? Where does information come from in our experience? Next slide. Um, my, my argument um, has been that, what, that we have an experiential basis for answering that question. You may, may recall from the interview last night, I talked about my, um, my time um, in Cambridge investigating the method of historical scientific reasoning. And Darwin's method was, was you know, really instructive to me because uh, what, he was, what he was doing was he was trying to re reconstruct what happened in the remote past. He was trying to identify the cause of the origin of new forms of life. And he built his ideas about historical scientific reasoning from the work of, uh, on the work of Charles Lyell, the famous geologist. And jo Lyell had a maxim. He said that when we're trying to ex explain events in the remote past, we, f we should be looking for causes that are now in operation. Causes now in operation. Uh, can I see the next slide? Is there something? Uh, one more? Okay, we'll have to go back to, uh, this is a truncated version of the slides. We had this little hiccup with the technology, so I'll just do this without a slide for a minute. I, want, I just want to explain the, 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 the scientific rationale for the theory of intelligent design or the positive case for intelligent design. So I'm studying the historical scientific reasoning, and I come across Lyell, and he says that, that um, the, the job of the historical scientist is to find causes that are now in operation, causes that produce the effect in question that we've seen in operation around us. So for example, when I was uh, an undergraduate, I studied uh, earth science, and I was in eastern Washington. Out in eastern Washington, they have this 
wonderful Palouse country with the rolling hills where they grow wheat, but there are still little patches there of white powdery stuff left over from this event a few years ago. And if you're a, if you're a geologist and you go there and you find these white powdery patches and you didn't know about the explosion of Mount St. Helens, you might wonder, well, where, what are these? How, did these? how did these get here? What caused these to get here? So using Darwin's method, you generate a lot of possible hypotheses. You'd say maybe it was a maybe it was an earthquake, maybe it was a maybe it was a flood, maybe it was a, a big storm, maybe it was a volcanic eruption. Of those four, which is the best explanation using Lyell's criterion of a cause now in operation, a cause that we have seen in our uniform and repeated experience producing the effect in question? Flood, earthquake. It's the volcanic eruption, because we've seen volcanoes produce white powdery stuff. Floods and storms don't usually do that, okay? So using our knowledge, our uniform and repeated experience of cause and effect relationships in the present enables us to reconstruct the causal history of events in the past. That was the whole method that Darwin and Lyell developed. Darwin called it looking for a vera causa, a true cause, a cause known to produce the effect in question. And as I got thinking about this, I realized, wait a minute, this applies to the whole question of the origin of information. Where, where does information come from in our experience? Where do we get programmed adaptive capacity or just a program? Well, we get it from minds, from intelligence. And in fact, whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a radio signal that has information embedded in it or a paragraph in a book, or I would even argue when these origin of life researchers are following these complex recipes and building these molecules and sequencing them just the way they want and extracting the, uh, the, the reaction products and purifying things, what they're doing in, on the you know, just basic axioms of information theory, anytime you exclude one option and elect another, anytime you say, I want a zero, not a one, or an A, not a T, you're imparting a bit of information. So the, to the extent that these simulation experiments have modeled the origin of life or a modeled chemistry that's at least moving in that direction, they're actually inadvertently modeling the need for intelligence to move the experiments in that direction. So they're confirming this basic principle that information comes from an intelligent source. And so when I was thinking about that, I came across a passage in a book on uh, app applying information theory to, uh, to biology, to molecular biology, and the information theorist Henry Quassler said, the, the, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. The light bulb went on for me. That's the Lyellian dictum, re, re, repeatedly associated as, or, uh, that's our uniform and repeated experience. That's what we use to infer causes in the past. So what we know, if, if information always comes from an intelligent source, and there's information at the foundation of life, and if new information is necessary to generate new forms of life, new animal life, and we know that the materialistic processes are not sufficient to do that, we have a really strong grounds for inferring intelligent design is the best explanation for the origin of the information necessary, yes, to build the first life, but also to build, to, to construct the Cambrian explosion. Or to turn that around, I would say that the Cambrian explosion with its informational requirements is best explained by the theory of intelligent design. And I wouldn't stop there, but I do want you to see on the previous slide how our critics have responded to this argument. If we can go back just one, this is Charles Marshall. Um, I was, I've never been more thrilled to have a negative review in my life. Uh, this was written in Science 2013. He uh, reviewed Darwin's doubt. It was a very respectful review. He liked some things about it, but he was also very critical of the fundamental thesis. And he said, Meyer's case depends upon the claim that the origin of new animal body plans requires vast amounts of novel genetic information. In fact, he says, our present understanding of morphogenesis, that just means body plan building, indicates that new, the new animals were not made by new genes, but largely emerged through the rewiring of gene regulatory networks. What are gene regulatory networks made of? Genes containing genetic information. So in order to explain the origin of information, he just invokes a prior unexplained source of information, the information in the gene regulatory networks. And he says that the evolutionary process somehow rewired those networks of genetic information, which would have required multiple coordinated changes in code, which would have been another source of unexplained genetic information. So you, I think this is very instructive because you really don't have to be a PhD in biology to see the nature of this, this dialectic. That in order to refute the case for intelligent design, 
people have either refused to engage the issue of the origin of genetic information, or they have simply presupposed unexplained sources of information, which doesn't solve the problem at all. And if that's the best that the best can do, and Charles Marshall is really one of the top scientists in this area. He's a terrific scientist. I admire his work. But I think on this point, he's come up sadly short. If that's the best the best can do, I think the theory of intelligent design is on very strong footing indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.